You know, it's interesting. If most of us go on a vacation, we check out the sites, the hotels, the restaurants, we do some investigation. Yet most people do no investigation on where they're going to go after they die. They put a great deal of effort into a short holiday and no effort into eternity. Well, I'm just here to share with you some information that will enable you to make an informed decision about your afterlife because you could be on the wrong path. You know, the wisest man that ever lived was King Solomon, except for Jesus. And he said in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So just remain open. And I'm gonna share with you the horrors of hell, and it's far worse than really any of us have ever imagined. But the good news is not one person has to go there, number one. But number two, I'm gonna show you at the end of this that it's a person's own words that condemn them to hell. It's not God. He's not sending them. A person's own words send them to hell. On November 23rd, 1998, I had an experience that changed my life. Now, it doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what the Bible has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. So in a vision, you can actually travel. Paul and John actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 44 talks about a natural body and a spirit body. In Ezekiel chapter 8, uh, he was picked up by his hair and carried from Babylon to Jerusalem in a vision. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. My point is, in a vision, you can experience the same things in your spirit body that you would in your physical body. And it's just as real. And this is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible. I'm just trying to give you a scriptural basis of how this can occur for a Christian. I've been a Christian for 51 years. And this happened uh, 23 years ago. So the only way a Christian can see hell is in a dream or a vision. Job 7.14 says, You scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. Isaiah 21.2, He was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. Now you might say, Bill, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to hell. Why do I need to hear about hell? Three quick reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. See, a lot of Christians today believe in a teaching called annihilationism. And that's a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus. But that is not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, or 46, he said, these shall go in everlasting life and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the word everlasting as the word ionios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. It says the same thing in John 5, 29, Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2, Acts 24, 15, Matthew 13, 30, many other verses that point out that hell is eternal and you'll thank God he saved you from this horrible place. Number two, it causes us as Christians to walk more in the fear of the Lord. You know, a lot of Christians, they said the sinner's prayer and they just go live their own life and do their own thing and they play around with the sinful lifestyle. You know, Mark 9, 47, Jesus said, if your eye offends thee, and the word offends means causes you to sin, he said, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter in the life maimed than in the hell fire. So when you understand how severe hell is, you will not want to play around with sin. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So it's a healthy, reverential fear of Almighty God. You know, I know we are to call Daddy Father, but at first we have to have a healthy, reverential fear of Almighty God. You know, this is God, and when you understand there's consequences for your actions, there's a law of sowing and reaping and so forth, you want to walk the straight walk. And uh, number three, it will give us more as Christians a passion for the lost, a desire to want to witness. You know, Bill Bright said only 2% of Christians even bother to witness. Even though Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's a command, not a suggestion for all of us. But yet so many don't. They come to church, hear a nice message and go home. And that's great if they come to church and hear a good message. But at the same time, we need to look for opportunities to witness. You know, so, and I'm not talking about chase people down and beat them over the head with the Bible. I'm just talking about each day as you get up, if you do this and say, Lord, use me today. I'm available. 
Put me in front of somebody that I can share your word with. If you have that heart, God will open up the doors for you. And we all have a sphere of influence. You know, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, even though that scripture is talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, most of the commentaries agree that he was also talking about judgment and hell in general. So when you understand judgment and hell in general, you'll be more persuasive with men. You'll not just pray a little light prayer and say, yeah, I prayed for my family. Lord, get my family saved or my neighbor, get them saved. No, you'll get on your knees and you'll fast and pray and cry out to God and say, Lord, send labors across their path, Father. Open up their ears and their eyes to the truth. Lord, let them see. I bind you, devil, off their mind. I bind you off of their mind. They will not go to hell. My family will not go to hell. You know, the effectual fervent prayer of a man avails much. So it's that effectual fervency. But when you understand hell, that it, you think, man, I didn't know hell was that bad. I cannot let my family go there or my friends. I've got to do more than I normally would do. And I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek God for them and pray that God gives them dreams or visions or whatever it takes to get them saved. So that's the heart I'm talking about. That's what understanding hell hopefully it will instill in all of us. Now, we went to a prayer meeting Sunday night that we attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual about the night. I had never studied the topic of hell at that point. I've never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I never had a vision before. And we came home, and I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And I was walking through our living room, and so suddenly something pulled me out of my body, like I was drawn up out of my body. I saw my body fall to the floor, and I started tumbling down this long tunnel, and it was getting hotter and hotter and darker and darker. And then I landed on an actual stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough-hewn stone walls, bars, filthy, stinking, dirty prison cell, but like a dungeon. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. And the word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says, they shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. And the Tyndale, the New International, many other commentaries point out that Jonah was actually at the gates of hell, and that was literal bars and gates. Well, that's where I first found myself, face down on the floor. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was like a blast furnace. I wondered, how could it be alive in this place? Well, my first reaction was I wanted to get up and run out of this prison cell. But I noticed I had no physical strength in my body. It took so much effort to try to move. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, it's a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes tremendous effort in hell. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts in the cell. They were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, a huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws that were about a foot long. And these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. There's scripture for that, but I got to keep moving. And they were pacing in the cell like a vicious caged animal. They were demons. And they were blaspheming and cursing God. They had an extreme hatred for God. But we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, and some others. Then they directed the hatred they had for God, they directed towards me. I wondered why. What have I done to them? But the one demon picked me up and threw me into the wall of this prison cell like I weighed the weight of a water glass. Demons have tremendous strength, and you have none. I hit the wall of this prison cell, and I collapsed on the floor. I wondered, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. Now, I have to explain something. I felt pain, but I understood most of it was being blocked. I didn't understand that then, 
But on the way back, the Lord explained to me that he blocked most of the pain, but he did allow me to feel a small amount of it so I could relate to people that it's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. And then the other demon that was in the cell picked me up and dug its claws in my chest and just tore the flesh open. I couldn't believe I was living through this. I should be dead. And I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You have a body. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about, he wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes to lift. You have a body in hell, but it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just all dry. But Leviticus 17, 11 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. But see, Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. They don't fear him in hell. So you don't derive that benefit. Now, about this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see, to describe to people what it looks like. But then he withdrew his light and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, you cannot see the hand in front of your face. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, he has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel the darkness. That's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt because it's so evil, the, the darkness just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body and you're, you're just terrified at every moment. Now, I was taken out of this prison cell by the Lord, but I didn't know it was the Lord and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across I just understood that, and it was like a huge hole in the ground with flames raging high up into this open cavern, and it wasn't metaphorical or allegorical flames. It was real fire. I saw the flames. I felt the heat, but more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11:6 6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, the angels shall sever the wicked from the just. Cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Isaiah 33, 12 says, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many more scriptures about fire, but... This is where I could first see people. I could see through the flames and I could see thousands of people in this pit burning. Now, most of us have never seen a person on fire. It's the most horrendous sight. Now, I could not distinguish a man from a woman. It just looked like skeletons. And it appeared to me that it looked like something like flesh or something hanging off their bones. I know that sounds horrible. I'm just telling you what I saw. And, you know, it's so dark in hell, it consumes a light. But I could just see through the flames and just barely along the edges. You know, a pit a mile across here on the earth with fire would produce a lot of light. But in hell, it doesn't. It is so dark, it consumes it. And I could see these people scream. And the screams were so loud and deafening. You want to get away from the screams, but you can't. You have to endure that for all eternity. But Isaiah 57, 21 says, there is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. There's no peace of mine, no peace of any kind. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, my people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not his people. So you don't derive the benefit of even quiet. Now, I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. So I understood that I was down deep in the earth. Uh, but more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that will tell you where the current hell is or Sheol. I'll just give you two. Ezekiel 26, 20 and number 16, 32 and 33. Very clear it's down deep in the earth. But I understood that. And I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. But remember Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. Well, that infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. 
Well, that infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is, there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is, is far worse than your mind can even conceive. Now, I wanted to let my wife know where I was at, but, but I knew I never, I never had that opportunity. You know, Job 7, 9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You grasp, you understand you're not going to get out. And you don't realize what a tormenting thought that is, to have no finality with your family, to never get to say goodbye. I knew I'll never get to hug my wife again and tell her I love her. I'll never get to be with her or the rest of my family. And to have no finality is extremely tormenting. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You still exist. You're just down deep in the earth. I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody. But even though I saw those people in the pit of fire, they're all burning anyway, but they're kept at a distance. So you have no conversation ever. You're completely isolated and by yourself for all eternity. And you have no purpose. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says, there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. Just a waste. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here, no one would know who you are there. Ecclesiastes 6, 4 says your name is covered in darkness. You have no identity. And you're completely forgotten in hell. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14, Deuteronomy 32, 26, Psalms 109, 15, many other verses talk about being forgotten. And you don't realize how tormenting of a thought that is. Nobody up on the earth is giving you a thought. Right? Do you think about anybody in hell? No, Right? And even if you go to a funeral today, no matter what the religion, they usually say, well, they've gone to a better place. But that's not the case. Matthew 7, Jesus said, many are going to hell and few are going to heaven. So you're completely forgotten. It's a place of confusion. Jeremiah 20, 11, Isaiah 45, 16 mentioned everlasting confusion. You know how we like things in order? Hell is chaos, confusion, hectic. Nothing makes any sense. And uh, Job 10.22 says, a land without any order. You know, we like things in order because we serve a God of order. Well, hell is the antithesis. No order. Hectic and crazy. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting air. You can't even believe it. Worse than any open sewer or anything you've ever smelled. But remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits. Mark 9.25, demons have a disgusting, foul odor to them. A decaying smell. Also, there's the smell of, it smells like burning flesh. And that's horrible to breathe. But also the smell of burning sulfur. And if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity of the sulfur coming up from the volcano, it's called sulfur dioxide. If you breathe it, it'll kill you. It's, it's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. You have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen in hell. And maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this or a fireman. And this is how you breathe in hell. It was like this. That was as much air as you could get. Well, that's not enough. Any moment you feel like you're going to suffocate. So that you have that ongoing feeling of suffocation. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God is very specific with his word. Uh, I was standing next to this big pit, and like I said, I could see just through the flames and just along the edges. And along the edges, I noticed I was standing beneath a tunnel, like a cavern ascending upward. And all along the cavern walls were demons. Some were only two and three feet tall, some were 12 and 13 feet tall, but everything was deformed, twisted, and grotesque. Demons are the most hideous looking creatures. And I noticed there were snakes, and also I looked down and I was standing on a bed of maggots, solid maggots. But remember, Jesus said, where their worm dies not. If you look it up, it's the word maggot. And Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. You look up in the Strong's Concordant, it's the word maggot. 
And I never knew this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, after they consume the flesh, maggots die. I never knew that. But they will die after they consume the flesh. That's why Jesus said where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24.20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? You're hungry. You never get to eat in hell. Thirst. Remember the rich man Jesus talked about in Luke 16. He wanted a drop of water. Now, if I was to give you one drop of water, that wouldn't suffice, would it? You would not value one drop. But in hell you would. You would do anything for that one drop of water. And just think that rich man is still yearning for that drop that he'll never get. The fear level in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. Now, many of us have gone through something in life that was fearful. Maybe you're in a war and you're at gunpoint or, or in a car accident and the fear that jumped up in your throat and so forth. I'm just gonna share with you an experience that I had so you can understand the fear because the Bible says fear has torment. And um, just relate this to you. Maybe you'll be able to relate. I used to surf a lot when I was a teenager. When I was 17 years old, I was surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida. And there was about 100 guys out that day. It was a big day. And when it's big in Florida there, it breaks out about a quarter to a half a mile out. So you're pretty far off the beach. And suddenly, the guy next to me got his leg torn off. A shark got him. It was blood all over the water. So I got up on my knees to get my legs out of the water on my board. And a shark passed by my board. I was on a nine-foot board. And he was longer than my board. It was a tiger shark. If you know anything about tiger sharks, they're vicious. They eat anything. And my buddy was knocked off his board. Shark knocked him off his board. The shark came back, bit my board right in half. And now I was swimming in the water and my buddy looked at me and he says, Bill, I guess we're dead. Because sharks were all over the place. And then one of the sharks came back and grabbed my leg and pulled me down under the water. Now you can imagine the fear that I felt. Even though maybe you haven't been through that, it's pretty fearful. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. Wouldn't even register. But Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with this terror for all eternity. But praise God, the shark not only opened his mouth and let me go, but I didn't have a mark in my leg. That's impossible. God was looking out for me. And you know, I was not even a Christian then. But I got saved immediately after that. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Hey, I knew that was God. And to make it all the way to the beach without getting attacked, that was God looking out for me. And I didn't understand it then, but a friend explained to me salvation. I received, I repented and received the Lord. And I've been serving him ever since. So it's been 51 years now, and God has been so good to me. And he's given me a wife that's way over my head. <clears throat> True. It's a wonderful blessing to serve the Lord, I've got to tell you. Now, I want to take a moment and give you some scripture. I know I've been giving you scripture, but that's what's important for you to hear and believe. It doesn't matter if you believe me. Uh, I don't blame you if you don't, but... You know, some people say, Bill, aren't you exaggerating hell? Come on, that's your idea of hell. No, that's the Bible's idea of hell, not mine. So can I take two minutes and give you some scripture about being tormented in hell? Is that okay? All right, Matthew 18, 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12, 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. Psalms 50, verse 22, you that forget God, you'll be torn in pieces. Matthew 24, 51, I will cut him in pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116, 3, the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5, 18 and 19, for what good is a day of the Lord to you, judgment day? It'll be darkness. And as a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Job 33, 22, his soul draws near to the pit and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141, 7, their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49, 14, their beauty shall consume away in Sheol from their dwelling. 
Psalms 32, 10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78, 49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. Deuteronomy 32, 22, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. Matthew 22, 13, Jesus said, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him in outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. John 15, 6, if a man abides not in me, just as men gather branches that are withered, they are thrown into the fire and are burned. Luke 12, 4 and 5, don't fear him who was able to kill the body and no more he can do. Rather, fear him who is after he is killed has power to cast into hell. I say to you, fear him. Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Mark 9, 43, if your hand or foot or eye offend thee, cut them off. It's better for you to enter in the life maim than in the hell fire where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Matthew 18, 8 and 9, cast them in everlasting fire into hell fire. And Matthew 23, 33, Jesus said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? He just told you they cannot escape hell. You'll never get out of this place. One more verse, Psalm 74, 20 says, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Full of the habitations of cruelty. The word cruelty, look it up in the Strong's Concordance, number 2555, it's the word Hamas. The terrorist group, Hamas, that word, Hamas. The word Hamas means ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. So for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of ruthlessness, violence, cruel hatred, and destruction. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. Now you say, Bill, why would God make such a horrible place? Well, Jesus said why in Matthew 25, 41. He said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this horrible place. But he used the word prepared. It's the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven. So prepare means make ready. So he was preparing heaven for us, hell for the devil. And so what he did in the preparation was, you see, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So all the good we enjoy in life, the fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good comes from God. It's not automatic. So what he did in the preparation, he simply withdrew his goodness or his attributes. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1.5 said God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says the mercy of the Lord's in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says water is the rain of heaven and there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says he is the prince of peace. So if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. So if your person in life says, you know what? I don't want anything to do with God. Well, fine. There's a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. You see that? Other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the scripture it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. It's your choice. God gives man a free will to choose. Now, as I was looking at all this horror, I was observing these people in the fire. There were individual pits of fire with people burning in their own individual pit. There's people in prison cells. There's people in this big pit. This is what I saw. Now, Isaiah 30, 33 says, hell is deep and large. It's a big place. I only saw a portion of it. I'm just telling you what I saw. But as I was looking at all this horror, and um, it was so dark, but something began lifting me up this tunnel. I began ascending up this tunnel. And it went absolute pitch black darkness. And then suddenly in this black darkness, this bright light appeared. Now I knew immediately who it was. I had no doubt in my mind, when Jesus shows up, there's no question in your mind who he is. None. 
I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure, holy light. But it was, not, it was like no light I had ever seen. It was pure. That's the only word I can say for it. And I just called out his name and I said, Jesus. And he said, I am. When he said I am, he said those two words, I went out. <clears throat> I don't know if I died or just passed out, but I can only explain it through Revelation 1.16. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun and I fell at his feet as one dead. <clears throat> so I was at his feet and I was out. And after time, he touched me. And when I came to, it hit me so strongly, even though I'd been a Christian for 28 years at that point, I thought, if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Thank you for dying for me, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I just wanted to thank him over and over. I didn't want to ask him any questions. You just don't when you're in his presence. You just want to worship him. I just kept saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because see, one second ago in my mind, I was in hell for all eternity. And now suddenly I know I'm a Christian. See, he, he blocked it from my mind. I'll get to that in a minute, explain that. But I just was so thankful. And, but after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind. And I didn't want to ask him, but he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says, he answers our thoughts afar off. I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Now, that statement surprised me. I thought, wait a minute. Don't all Christians believe in hell? We have found out since many Christians believe in annihilationism or universalism. That's another false teaching that says everybody gets saved. And soul sleep. There's many false teachings. I'm just a signpost to point people to the scriptures and check those scriptures out. I said, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. See, John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. Demons hate God, but they cannot hurt him, but they can hurt his creation. And that's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We serve a good God that came to give us life. Yeah. So the evil, the destruction, the sickness, poverty, all that comes from the demonic realm. It's not from God. We serve a good and a loving God. I said, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. But I have to admit, I complained now, I told my best friend only when we came back from this experience, I shared it with my best friend because he knows me. He knows I would, I'm not crazy, you know. And um, he said, Bill, would you come to my Bible study and share it? I said, no way. I, I don't want to share it. And uh, he said, no, please come. So he, he convinced me to come after about three months. I went reluctantly. So I shared it. And, well, it spread from there. We began getting invited all over the country. And so for the next seven years, there was no book then, so for the next seven years, we paid our own way. We never took one penny from anybody for those seven years. And then after that, the publisher approached me and they said, would you write a book on what you experienced? I said, oh, I'm not a writer. I'm a real estate broker. And uh, <clears throat> who would buy my book anyway, you know? And uh, so it's not something I wanted to self-promote, but I was happy to write the book so I could put in there all the scriptures. That's what's important for people to believe. Read the scripture for yourself. But I complain because I'm a conservative person. And to be identified with someone that says they've been to hell, you know, I pictured somebody like with wild hair and a wooden sign on a street corner screaming, repent or burn, you know. <clears throat> I mean, that's what I envision. I said, oh, Lord, I feel uncomfortable. Besides, not, not only that, but hell was so severe, I thought, Lord, I'm not a gifted enough speaker to even get it across to people how severe hell really is. And, but I complained. And after seven years, I heard the Lord say to me, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Man, that convicted me. But you know, 
Now it doesn't matter if I feel uncomfortable. If one person can come to the light of the scripture and avoid this horrible place, then it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel. All right? Hey. I'm sure Paul felt uncomfortable being in prison, beaten, shipwrecked, and uh, stoned, and everything else he went through, right? But the point is, you know, God's given us all something to do. So I encourage you, whatever God's called you to do, do it with all your heart. Because we don't have a lot of time. And, you know, God's given you an ability or a talent that I don't have. And it's a team effort. There's no big shots with God. We all need each other to win souls. Anyway, I thought, Lord, why didn't I know you? See, I didn't explain to you that God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. You say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary point out, quote, they were kept by God from recognizing him. So God hid it from their mind. Other examples of this are in John, oh, I'll just, I'll leave that. I could go on and on with that. But the point was he hid it from my mind for this reason. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was but I didn't know, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here. Right? As a Christian, we know our destiny is heaven. But he wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. See, none of us in life here know what it's like to be hopeless because even if your situation is so painful, so dire, you can always die to escape the pain. But in hell, you understand you're not going to get it. You're not going to escape it. You're never going to get out. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. That's the worst part of hell, understanding a hundred million years go by and it's still day one. I just want that to sink into you for a minute because we cannot grasp, we think of time as a timeline, that it's going to end at some point. But you understand when you're in hell, it's never going to end. You can see why this decision is so important. People slough it off and think, oh, I'll think about it later. They might not have later. We went above the earth. We came out of this tunnel. And I, I, I don't know if I have time to share a couple of the things here, but we, we were in this tunnel that we came out of the earth and it extended above the earth. I can't explain that, but it was a tunnel, like a whirlwind tunnel. But there's four verses that talk about a whirlwind going into hell. And uh, anyway, so we went above the earth, came out of this whirlwind tunnel, and we were above the earth. We were out in space. I, w I look back at the earth. It was amazing to see the earth from space. Now, most of us have never seen that, right? Now, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be an astronaut. I believe God remembered that thought. And he, you know, he took me the scenic route home, you know? <laughs> he didn't have to do that. <clears throat> now, maybe I watched too much Star Trek when I was young, but, <laughs> but the point is to see the earth from space it was just hung on nothing. Job 26, 7 says, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. It's like, what's holding it up? What's making it turn so perfectly at 1,000 miles an hour, not varying at all? And I could grasp the oceans, how big they are, and they're not spilling over onto the land. You know, you can't even walk across the room with a bowl of water without spilling it, right? <laughs> God's got it spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, and the oceans stay put because he gave his command that it would not move, you know? I looked out in the space, I could grasp a little bit more than we do here, how big of the universe is. And there are endless stars, there's not even a number for them, billions and trillions and billions. And he has a name for every one of them. Can you imagine? He's named every single star. And there's, you can't even count them. And he says his hand spans the universe. I was grasping a little bit more than we can here how big of a God we serve. And how he knows every thought in our mind at every moment, every hair on our head, at every moment, and there's seven billion people on the earth, and he's controlling all that, and every planet, and every star. I just thought, Lord, you're a big God. You can answer my prayer, Lord. I, I just, it gave me more faith when we pray, you know, to trust God. And I was enjoying all that, but then he had me turn around and look at that tunnel we just came out of, that whirlwind tunnel, and people were falling one after another, after another, back down into hell. And he actually let me feel a piece of his heart. 
And I couldn't even bear to feel a little bit of God's heart, the anguish he feels for a soul falling into hell. And he wept. And he wanted me to remember just his heart so I would have a piece of his heart to go after the lost so they wouldn't have to go there. See, God's entrusted us with the gospel. That is a privilege. We have the words of life that can change someone's eternal destiny if we just open our mouth and be sensitive. You know, not preach down to people, but have a heart for people and really listen to them and try to share, show them how much you care for them and that God loves them and doesn't want them to go to hell. But he's given them a free will. Anyway, he allowed me to feel that. I couldn't even stand to feel it. I just said, Lord, stop. I I can't take even a little bit of the heart you have. See, Ephesians 3.19 says, his love passes knowledge. His love is way past our ability. And I just want to share another scripture with you that's really important. Uh, He shared this with me. Uh, Psalms 139, 17 and 18. David said, your thoughts toward me are all precious. And I suppose if I should count them, they are more than the sands. And another place in Psalms, it says more than the sands on the whole earth. Now, what he showed me was, see, if I was to pick up a handful of sand, there'd be thousands of granules in my hand, right? Lots of granules. If I was to take each one, each one was a thought, like God just said in Psalms 139, and I said, I love how beautiful my wife is. I love how she prays for her parents all the time. I love how she prays for others. I love how considerate she is. And you came back three or four hours from now, and I'm trying to exhaust the amount in my hand. You would say, Bill's really gone over his wife, right? He's crazy about her. That's just to exhaust the amount in my hand. Well, he said his thoughts towards us are all precious, all precious, and more than the sands on the whole earth. Now, can, we can't even grasp how many sand granules there are. And that's not an exaggeration because God can't exaggerate. Amen. So he, his thoughts toward you are all precious and they're more than the sands on the whole earth. That's how much he loves you. So now you can see why he said his love passes knowledge. That's way past us. So we serve a good and a loving God. And he proved it by dying on the cross for us. <clears throat> Now, you might say, Bill, how can this loving God send a good person to hell? Well, God doesn't send anybody to hell. I'll get to that in a minute. But if you're going to go by the standard of good, then you have to go by God's standard. See, your standard and God's are two different things. James 2.10 says, if we offend his law in one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. If we steal one thing, 1 Corinthians 6.9 says, no thief will inherit heaven. If we have one lustful thought, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery and no adulterer will inherit heaven. Well, that's just three of the 10 commandments. So if we're gonna be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? We all be guilty. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24.9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If we have one foolish thought our entire life, that would exclude us from heaven. That's a high standard. So none of us can stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm pretty good, let me in. He's going to say, no, not not according to my standard, no. Matter of fact, Job 15, 16 says, man is so filthy, he drinks iniquity like water. That's what we look like in God's presence. Thank God it's not based on being good, but on a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> but you might not be convinced yet. You know, this good might really bother you. You might think, my neighbor, they're good people. How can they go to hell? Well, I was on a secular radio talk show host syndicated across America. And they said, Bill, watch your back with this guy. He does not like Christians. And he will spit you off the air in a, in a minute. And so just be careful. So I went on the air and he says, okay, Christian, don't you quote me one Bible verse on my airways. You got that? No Bible on my airways. And he said, I submit to you that your God is unreasonable because he doesn't consider my viewpoint. My viewpoint is just as valid as yours, and I'm a good person. And I should be let into heaven because I'm a good person. And he said, if your God doesn't let me into heaven, he's actually guilty of a hate crime. (laughs) So what do you got to say for yourself, Christian? Well, what do you say? You're live on the air. Well, God gave me an analogy. Thank God. You know? because I couldn't give scripture. And I said, okay, you think you're a good person. You you should go to heaven. He goes, that's right. I said, okay, say you went and found the most expensive home in the country and you knocked on their door and you said, "Uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? 
you don't know them. You wouldn't expect them to let you move into their house. I said, but you, you go through your whole life. You have nothing to do with God. You deny Jesus as the son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of your life, you have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because you're a good person. What is good? What does good have to do with it? I said, what does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You have no relationship with him. I said, see, God offered to be your father throughout your whole life, but you pushed him away. You said, I don't want you as my father. See, God is your creator. He's not your father to invite in Jesus as your savior. Then he becomes your father. Now you have the privilege of living at his house. But to expect to live at someone's house you don't even know, that's unreasonable. He said, whoa, you can fight back. He said, he was a tough New Jersey guy, you know. New York and New Jersey have a reputation, which I like. Their bottom line, don't pull any punches. And uh, I said, well, I heard you can take it. Can you dish it out? You know, I heard you can dish it out. Can you take it? And uh, he says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. And he said, I, I just think all roads lead to God. That's what I think. And, I, and so God gave me another analogy right on the air. Thank God. <laughs> And I said, okay, narrow-minded, you think all roads lead to heaven. And he said, that's right. And I said, okay, say you invited me over to dinner to your home. And you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. But that's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. <laughs> You're going to tell me, Bill, I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. Well, the same thing. God's given us clear directions to his house. I think God knows where he lives, right? That's not narrow-minded. That's specific. He's given us specific, clear directions on how to get to his house. He's not trying to keep us out. See, people think God's up there arbitrarily saying, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. It's not that way. All of us above the age of accountability are automatically on the road to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 says we're condemned already because we're born in sin, Psalms 51, 2. So that's different than being sent there. We're already going there. That's why Jesus came and planted a cross right in the middle of that road that we're all on. So all we have to do is look up to the cross, repent of our sin, receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. You know? One last thing I'll share what he said to me. He said, Bill, but, you know, can't God overlook my sin? I mean, come on. Uh, you know, I'm a good person. I don't kill anybody. And that's the other misconception. If you don't kill anybody, you're good enough for heaven, you know. And I said, no, God cannot for two reasons. Number one, God is a good judge. A good judge in our land would not be considered good if he let the criminal go free, right? The crime has to be punished. Our sin has to be punished. But Jesus took it for us. But if you deny him, then you have to take it. But the second reason he cannot overlook our sin is because Hebrews 12, 29 and Nahum 1, 5 says, God is a consuming fire. And it says in Nahum 1, 5 that all of us would be consumed at his presence because he's holy. See, his nature is different than ours. See, if I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and the fire burned me, I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn me? That was mean in that fire. I wouldn't say that, would I? No, because the nature of the fire is to burn. My hand and fire are not compatible. Well, neither is a holy God and sinful man compatible. He has to give us a new nature, a new heart, a new spirit that's compatible with his. And that doesn't come through good works. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So if the only way we can stand before holy God is if someone came and lived the perfect life and never sinned once, and that's Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he stands before the Father and says, I've never sinned. I'm going to exchange my righteousness with you, Father, for their sin. I'll take their sin, and I'll wash it away with my blood. If they would trust in the cross, I'll consider their trust as if they were righteous. So he considers our trust as righteousness. We trust him, and then he washes away our sin. So now we can stand before a holy God as if we've never sinned because our sins are dealt with. Then he gives us a new heart and a new spirit that's compatible with his. Isn't that an amazing plan that God came up with? You know? You know, people complain. They say, you know, I don't like this one-way business you Christians have. You ought to be grateful there is a way. 
<laughs> he made a way where there was none. Thank God for the way. That's right. You know, just quickly, um, my neighbor was uh, a tough Marine, really tough guy, and he was an atheist. I tried to talk to him over the years, and he wouldn't listen. But one day I found out he was in the hospital, my wife and I, so we went to see him. And he was all shriveled up and tiny now and weak and hooked up the tubes. And he was crying. And when I walked in, he said, he said, Bill, I am so scared. He says, I've never been afraid of anything in my life. But he said, I was dying last night and I was slipping out of my body. I was headed for hell. I know I was. Please tell me, how do I stay out of hell? How do I stay out of hell? He just got a glimpse. He was not even in hell, and it terrified him. That's how severe hell is. We ended up leading him to the Lord. He got saved, and then he died a few days later. Thank God we went to see him. But my point is, you do not want to even get a glimpse of hell. And this is the clear directions to heaven. John 3.36 John 3, says, He that believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he that believes not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You have to know the Son. How do you do that? Just two verses. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. What does repent mean? That means to have a humble heart, to admit I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself, and I'm willing to turn away from a sinful lifestyle and follow Jesus. It's not enough to just mentally assent to the fact that Jesus is God and say, yeah, I can believe that. That's not repentance. You've got to turn away from sin and agree to follow Jesus. That's a true repent of heart. And number two, Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You've got to believe it in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you want to live at his house, you do it his way. There's only one way. Now, if you say, Bill, I just don't believe that. Well, then I have a verse for you. Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. He just told you, if you don't believe Jesus is the only way, you will end up in the lake of fire. That's why you can see why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe Jesus is the only way. I don't believe the Bible. A person sends himself to hell by their own words. And God has to allow it because he's a God of love and love gives a free will to choose. He can't force you into anything. You know, Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book and he's gonna look to see if our names are in his book. And you know, when the Titanic set sail, there were all different religions, all different beliefs, all different walks of life on that ship and they say there were three classes of people, the lower, the middle, and the upper class. But when the ship went down at the White Star Line office in Liverpool, England, there were two signs posted and the people would wait anxiously each day as a man would come out and write their relative's name down on one of the signs. One sign said, known to be saved. The other one said, known to be lost. Now, when the ship left, there were all different beliefs, all different walks of life, all different religions, and three classes of people. But in the end, there's only two. You're either saved or you're lost. And it's your choice. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just have one question for you all. Do you know if your name is written in his book? Are you certain? You need to be certain of this one. Because one second after you die, it's too late. You'll not get a second chance. And please don't think I can leave here and I can think about it later. Because once you leave here, your heart actually grows harder and it's more difficult to reach you. And you're not promised tomorrow. This is the most important decision you could ever make. And your soul is eternal. You will spend it in one place or the other. Heaven is not our default destination. There needs to be a purposeful act on our part. So if you would say, Bill, I don't know if my name's in his book, but I want it to be. I want assurance that it's in his book. 
Or you might say, Bill, I, I've never really repented and I want to be sure I'm going to heaven. I don't want to take a chance with my soul. Or maybe there's even a, another group that you might know God, but you've been living compromised and you wanna, you, you're tired of playing around with sin. You want to get your life right again with God. You want to come back to Him. I'm going to invite you at the count of three to raise your hand if that's you, if you want your name in there, if you're willing to repent, or you're willing to just get your life back right with God. And you can do this online also. And we're going to say a prayer in just a minute. I'm going to ask you now at the count of three, slip up your hand. One, two, three. Slip up your hand. I see hands all over. I see hands. Nothing to be embarrassed about. You know, Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. You want to make sure he sees that hand. You're not doing this half-heartedly. This is a full commitment to God. If everybody would stand to their feet, I'm going to invite each one that raised their hand, even in the balcony, could you come down to the front and just give us a privilege of praying for you? I know it takes some effort to get out of your seat, come down here just for a few minutes. But you know, you'll never forget this time coming to the altar. It's a special time. <clears throat> right. <clears throat> Make your way down. All right, this is the opportunity, so we're going to pray. Y'all ready? Okay, all you people that came forward, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands. It's like an act of surrender, You're saying, Lord, I surrender my life to you. And we're going to say this prayer. You're going to repeat after me, but it's going to come from your own heart. It's going to change your whole eternity. We can all say this prayer together. You ready? All right, say, Dear God in heaven, I know that I sinned, and I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he was crucified, died and was buried, but rose again and lives forevermore. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. I repent. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. Fill me with your Spirit, and I'll serve you all the days of my life. I now confess I'm a born-again Christian going to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yes. Praise God. Woo!